Good morning, Grace Rolek. Welcome on VH Berries. Hello, thank you for having me. <laughs> I am extremely grateful because I noticed that very soon we will not only see you at film festivals, but also in your showrooms <laughs> because uh, you're enjoying uh, vanity plates. <laughs> yes, that is very true. I do love to snap pictures of funny license plates when I get the chance. I actually had a roommate who was very into uh, snapping vanity plate pictures, and so a lot of the time I send them to her. <laughs> I also saw that you're also driving yourself, so is it part of your plan to have your own one? Oh, <laughs> maybe. I'm just really indecisive, so... I don't know. I'd have to brainstorm. I mean, you only get seven <laughs> characters, so it's hard to say. It is very hard to say because you were uh, posting some of them, for example, some called I'm Alone or <laughs> Cast Me. <laughs> Oh yeah, Cast Me was very funny because we were, I mean, I was driving in the middle of LA and I was like, what better advertising is there than that if you're a model, actress, whatever. <laughs> Absolutely, Grace Rolek. And next to uh, that great idea with those vanity plates, there is another object that is very close to your heart. And this time, I am talking about the mailboxes. Oh, yes, yes, my... Uh, my directorial debut. Yeah, I made a short film back in 2019 entitled Mailboxes, which was really personal to me actually because it was shot in the um, UPS store that my dad is the manager of, which is how I was able to use a real UPS store to film there. <laughs> so I was able to film when they were closed and it was a really awesome experience. And I got to work with, um, my dear friend, Zach Callison, who is the voice of Steven on Steven Universe. Absolutely. And can you tell us a little bit more about the storyline? Because... You are the writer, the director, but also um, one of the person behind Secret Treasure, Hidden James. Yes, yeah, that is um, my dear friend Azul Nino's production company, and they are super talented. They were the cinematographer, editor of Mailboxes, and they helped out in so many different ways. They did all of the um, storyboards. It, I, I couldn't have done it without their help. Um, but the story of Mailboxes follows um, two people working at this Un unnamed mailbox store, but it, it was shot in a UPS store, but for legal reasons, it's not actually a UPS store. <laughs> um, but they are two early 20 year old workers, Lionel and Gertrude, and they're both dealing with that Gen Z millennial malaise of what am I going to do with my life? And that was a very personal sort of conundrum for me at the time too. I wrote it when I was 20 or 21 and I'm only 24 now, but I think that I was feeling a sort of where am I going? What am I doing? And I just want to put that into art. So it follows them having a slow day at work and everything sort of comes to a head when a random girl decides to steal some office supplies. <laughs> and Grace Rolek, you just mentioned a very decisive person, which is your father, yes. who uh, gave you that very special location. Yes, yes. And that location is actually a very important place to me. I was homeschooled as a kid, so I used to do a lot of schoolwork in the back of that UPS store. And actually, um, that UPS store was really close. It, it's the 
Toluca Lake UPS store, and that is really close to Disney and Warner Brothers and all of those places. And so growing up in LA, it was really easy for me to fall into acting. And I started acting when I was about four years old. And it was easy for me to sort of just fall into it because living in LA, I didn't have to uproot my life to go to auditions. It was something where I could do my schoolwork in the back of the UPS store and then just take a drive to a casting office from there. So it was not a crazy commute. <laughs> It was a very precious place for you, Grace Rolek, but also for thousands of people living nearby because um, a post office is often a metaphor for a place in which thousands of letters and uh, also important objects are shipped every single day. Absolutely, absolutely. I do. I definitely think that there was a convenience of putting uh, that place as the setting of my short film, but I definitely think that there is something symbolically resonant about being in this place where you're sort of in the middle of all of these things coming through and being shipped out and coming in and sometimes getting lost. <laughs> Sometimes some stuff can be lost and Grace Rolek, I truly believe that um, maybe that some objects were lost and I may be talking about a book called We Are Not Free oh, uh, that yeah. was maybe transitioned through these postal offices. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, I love the author Tracy Chi. Um, I have, I was part of the audiobook narrators. There was a larger cast. Um, different chapters were narrated by different people. So the book is called We Are Not Free by Tracy Chi, which covers the story of young people living in a Japanese internment camp. So it's a historical fiction novel uh, talking about the Japanese internment of the mid 20th century. But Tracy Chi also recently asked me to be the audiobook narrator for her new book, A Thousand Steps Into Night, which you can find me as the audiobook reader on Audible. But that one is not historical fiction, just straight up pure fiction, very amazing fantasy story about a young girl named Miyuko who gets turned into a demon and has to navigate that. It's a really fun book. Um, and so it, it's been a pleasure to be able to bring Tracy Chi's words to life in not one, but two books. It was a pleasure to bring uh, back to life this work from the author Tracy Chi. And in definitive, Grace Rolek, we can say that your life was to go from one to a thousand, as you just mentioned, because your second short film is called One Hit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, so I didn't write or direct that one, but I did uh, help in a lot of ways. Um, it was, I, I think I assisted, directed, but one of my dear friends from high school, Um, his name is Logan Robinson. And after that summer that we filmed Mailboxes, my friend Logan was getting ready to go off to college, go back to college, I should say. And he was like, I want to make another short film this summer. And so we really quickly just figured out in a ragtag sort of way. I mean, both Mailboxes and One Hit were sort of thrown together just in this summer where we were like, how can we be creative with a small budget and just make art with our friends? So we got a group of friends together and just over these like really intense weekends just made short films, which was a really fun experience. And I'm hoping that in the future, the next time I tackle another similar project like that, I'll put a little bit more time and money into it. 
but it was a really amazing experience to make both mailboxes and one hit. But that is my friend, uh, my friend Logan Robinson was the writer and director of One Hit. You just, uh, Grace or Leck, use that very powerful word of tackle. <laughs> and if I come back to uh, uh, that book uh, uh, written by uh, Tracy Chi, this book tackles also a very precious subject um, because there is a direct link uh, with your grandma called Maruko. Yes, yeah. Um, so I am a quarter Japanese. And so my, <laughs> my, my family was um, interned in the uh, Japanese internment. I mean, they were forcibly removed from their communities and... It's a really precious topic to me because I, you know, I, I grew up in a time where, I mean, I didn't know the history of Japanese internment until I was a teenager and hearing about it, it was, I mean, it was one of those things where I couldn't believe that it was my first time hearing about it. And then to find out that it had affected my family and I felt like being a part of We Are Not Free was a really amazing way to honor my family and especially my grandmother, Maruko. Um, it, was, it, it was really powerful to be able to not share her story, but share a story that mirrored so many of the experiences in the Japanese American community. It mirrors a lot of uh, experiences. And I'm curious about your experiences uh, reading the book. Because if I understood correctly, uh, it is a story that is very close to yours. So how was it to read it out loud and to record it? Was it hard in sometimes because you were going on some testimonies, for example? Well... It was, it was very sweet because I was able to read two characters' stories, um, but the chapter, I mean, it was, it's always challenging when you are voice acting for um, stories that do have this sort of deep emotional bottom to them where you're having to convey just with your voice the emotionality when in other forms of acting you would be able to see the subtleties and the facial expressions and the body language and when you're voice acting you only have control over your voice and you can take pauses but it's all in the inflection and it was really challenging at times because I did put this pressure on myself to really do my due diligence and honor the circumstances in the story. And hopefully, <laughs> I don't know if anyone listening has listened to the audiobook, but I can only hope that I did my job. <laughs> You sure did your job, and I totally agree. It's all about the inflection. And those last one evolved through your journey in Los Angeles because you started uh, your life doing uh, a little bit of everything and then uh, to more uh, being uh, specialized into voiceover. But now... <laughs> As the same image as a boomerang, Grace Rolek is coming back more and more to on camera's work. <laughs> yes, yes, it's been it's been a journey. I mean, I think that I felt, especially when I was younger, that I had so much more freedom in voiceover, which makes sense. I mean, I remember I worked a job as a kid. Um, on this Disney thing called Wiffle and Fuzz, which was for um, Playhouse Disney. Now it's called Disney Junior, but Playhouse Disney as it was at the time. And I was a fluffy red ball. 
<laughs> and so as a kid, I, I liked not being <laughs> constrained by my physicality in any way. I could be a talking rabbit. Uh, I could be a fluffy red ball. But now, I mean, I definitely think that I want to do everything. I mean, it's come through and me trying to tackle uh, writing and directing, which I want to continue doing more of, but also in being on camera, I just want to find other ways to be in service to storytelling. I just want to be able to tell stories, be a part of just being in vehicles to share stories that other people have written. And I just don't want to limit myself in any way. <laughs> You don't want to limit yourself to any way. And Grace Rolek, uh, it makes a lot of sense because uh, you are now trying to evolve and start a new chapter of your life, especially after dedicated, uh, dedicating uh, seven plus years of your life uh, to uh, animated series called... Uh, Steven Universe from 2014 to 2020. Yeah, it, I mean, I am so immensely grateful for my time being a part of Steven Universe playing Connie Maheshwaran. I mean, <laughs> being being on that show changed my life. I I mean, I I had been acting since I was four, and I booked Steven Universe, I believe, when I was 15, and so. That between I, that, those 11 years, I had definitely worked. I had been a part of a lot of other fabulous projects. But by the time I was a teenager, I was starting to question whether or not I would continue acting because I was in high school. I mean, I was with my friends and we were all talking about where we wanted to go to college. And I just wasn't sure if acting was what I wanted to continue doing. But Being a part of Steven Universe sort of reignited my passion for acting because I was part of this cast and crew that was so dedicated and it was the first time that I really got to see how a project that I was a part of was actually impacting people's lives because Steven Universe tackled <laughs> so many um interesting uh, concepts and gave, shown, shown a light on so many things that were unprecedented in children's animation. I mean, the way that Steven Universe really made, it, it put queer representation in children's animation on the map. I mean, it was, it was really beautiful to see how also the depiction of mental health issues in a way that could resonate with children and adults. I mean, Steven Universe, while it was a kid's show, had such a wide appeal. And I can only, I mean, speaking of being in service, like I, I just wanted to be, be a, be in service to Rebecca Sugar and her vision. I mean, Rebecca Sugar, the creator of Steven Universe, I, I think that I owe such a debt to because her vision for Steven Universe was so much bigger than I knew at the time when I booked the show. And writer and storyboard uh, artist Rebecca Sugar uh, didn't thought that uh, Mahes Waran wouldn't fit in a vanity plate. <laughs> <laughs> This is very sad, but I have an idea, as always. We can just write uh, the seven letters, uh, Maheswa, and put a pictures of someone running because he ran in the oh. past. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, yeah. If I wanted to have... I'm sure, I'm sure some people have some good Steven Universe-related vanity plates, If anyone listening to this has any, they should DM me, DM me pictures. I also believe that there is maybe a little chance that your character called Connie 
maybe we'll have an original spin-off movie in the future. I mean, if that did happen, let's just say I would be completely on board. <laughs> <laughs> It cannot happen without Grace Rolex for sure. Um, and I'm very curious about some points that you just mentioned just before, because you told that um, Steven Universe was tackling a very important subject for uh, children and children. Uh, the childhood, for example, concerning the representation. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Absolutely. Well, I mean, so speaking to Connie, uh, it was it was sort of clever. Uh, but when I, fusion is a huge part of Steven Universe, uh, where two gems. Uh, this is going to be a lot for people listening who if they haven't seen Steven Universe, but there is a concept in the show where two gem beings can fuse together and become something bigger and better than that than just one of them. And so Garnet, one of the characters, um, one of the main characters played by Estelle, is a fusion of Ruby and Sapphire. And they are they were so in love that they wanted to stay fused together. And there was actually a wedding episode, um, which was really amazing, but Ruby and Sapphire are... I mean, technically the gems are genderless beings, but they pretty much all use she, her pronouns. But... Yeah, so it was a really amazing way to show a gay wedding in a children's animated show. But also, Connie and Steven are able to fuse because Steven is half gem and half human. And because he's half gem, he can fuse with humans. And he's able to have a fusion with Connie named Stevani who is canonically non-binary because quite literally they're half male and half female, which is, you know, it's, it's incredible that because you're able to use these they, them pronouns in a children's show because it's literally a fusion of two people. So it was a really clever way to have this representation on a network kid show is really amazing and Rebecca Sugar is a genius and I I think that the world of animation is forever changed by her and the entire Steven Universe crew. I mean, there's such a talented team of storyboard artists and uh, writers that I would I I can't name them all, but they're they're all so talented and amazing and they're all moving on to such amazing things too, so. Every single two characters can fusion a little bit, Grace Rolex. Um, <laughs> like the heirloom bits that you're fusioning with the seeds <laughs> to make some borch, which is a <laughs> word that I never heard of before. So... I am a huge gardening fanatic. That has been my uh, hobby of choice, especially <laughs> since the pandemic started. Um, I have a little garden in my front yard, which I love tending to, but I, a lot of the time, make borscht with my homegrown beets. And borscht is a Eastern European soup. It has, I, mean, I think that a lot of countries fight over who, com who created borscht, but I became familiar with borscht because I used to live around the corner from a Russian bakery in San Francisco called Cinderella's Bakery. If you're ever in the Bay Area, highly recommend it. They have amazing Russian food and the women who work there are amazing. But I would go around the corner and get a bowl of borscht and it would be served with some rye bread. And so it's a beetroot soup um, that has cabbage and potatoes and traditionally it's sometimes made with meat. I usually don't make it with meat, but it's good with meat if you're, if you eat meat. Um, 
I do eat meat. I just think that the uh, the soup is sufficient without it. But I also I just love to cook, and if you make a big pot of borscht, I like to just keep going back to it and have leftovers of it. And it's traditionally served with a dollop of sour cream and a sprig of dill. So it's one of my favorite thing to make things to make when I have stuff from my garden. And the last time I made it, I also had some heirloom carrots that I was able to put in it as well, which was amazing. <laughs> right now I'm growing jalapenos, habaneros, and these peppers called sugar rush peach. I usually like to shake it up, whatever I'm growing. And my hope is that after this batch, I'm gonna be able to have like a salsa and hot sauce making night with my friends. I'm looking forward to see all of that. And Grace Rolek, when you're making some great recipes and that when you're cooking in this special garden, you actually need a table, but good news because Grace Rolek can also make voiceover, but also can restore your table. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you did your research. I, um, <laughs> yes, that was another one of my hobbies that I picked up with my extra free time over the last couple of years. One of my roommates at the time had found this really damaged um, side table um, just sitting out on the corner on the street and brought it back and was like, I feel like we could do something with this. And so I went out to Lowe's and I got a sander and wood stain and just went to town. And I actually, it's out of frame right now, but it's holding a lamp and some candles uh, just outside of frame. <laughs> Absolutely. And to come back uh, on um, the project that are into the frame, uh, you are involved in a project uh, called The Times. They are uh, changing. Can you tell us about what is going on yeah. in the screen? Um, that's actually interesting. I worked on that short film a couple of years ago, and I'm actually not sure what the when it is coming out, but it was really, really fun to work on. I hope it does eventually come out. <laughs> um, I it was it was a fun project because it was half set in the 70s and half set in present day, and it was kind of showing the changing attitudes between the 70s and today. I actually have no idea what the status on that project is, but if it does come to light, I would love to watch it because it's also funny because now I filmed it a few years ago now. So it'll be really interesting to see. I, I feel like I've grown a lot as an actor since I filmed that. So hopefully I'm not sitting there watching it like, but it's also it's also so hard to watch your own work a lot of the time. The thing I like about voiceover is that there's a degree of separation. Like I can I can judge my own voice as I'm hearing it, but I don't have to watch my face. <laughs> Absolutely. If I understood correctly, Grace Rolek, it is easier to hear ourselves than, than to see and hear yourself. Just just a little bit. I mean, I think that there, it depends. There are some actors that have no problem watching their own work, and there are others who never want to see anything that they've been in. I definitely find that I can bounce back and forth between those two extremes. Sometimes I want to enjoy it, and just, especially if I like the piece as a whole. I'm like, yeah, let's, let's see. But other times I'm like, ah, oh, no. <laughs> Finger crossed, Grace uh, Rolek. Uh, I think that uh, <laughs> your a spin-off original movie around Connie Ma Maheswaran will be released before this uh, short <laughs> film called The Times. They are uh, changing. It's possible. It's possible. Um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't. I remember. Like last year, I sent an email to one of the producers asking about it, but I don't know. 
we'll see. But there are other there are other cool things that I've been working on. Um, I've got a lot of video games that I've been working on recently. There's um, Fallout 76, the Wastelanders expansion. You can hear hear me as the radio DJ, um, Julie. There's also um, a mobile game called Seven Nights 2. You can hear me as Len. And there's another mobile game, and this one's fun because it's Final Fantasy, which Final Fantasy VII Advent Children was like my first big voiceover role playing Marlene. But in Final Fantasy VII, The First Soldier, I believe, um, it's a mobile game and I, am, I lead you through the tutorial and my name is Lucia, or Lucia, I forget. As a voice actresses, your actual voice is your tool for working. Do you have special pieces of advices or tips to protect your own voice? That is something that I've had to get a little bit more serious about as I've gotten older and especially with video game work because a lot of video game work is a lot harder on your voice. It depends sometimes in animation <laughs> if you're doing a character that is really zany and you have to like really strain your throat. It depends, but I swear by peppermint tea. I drink a lot of peppermint tea. If I need some energy of green tea, but... And then if, if, if things are really serious, you got to get some honey and lemon in there. And also a lot of the time people think that whispering is better for your voice, but actually like if, if you're trying to save your voice, just whispering, but actually whispering strains your voice more than talking does. So it's better to just say nothing <laughs> or just very few words at your, in your normal voice. Just don't, don't go like because it's actually harder on your vocal cords. A lot of people don't know that. Absolutely. And I would love to uh, discuss about those um, two years, a little bit less than two years, that you spent in San Francisco uh, studying something. Yes. Because from what I've uh, remembered, you just told that you really enjoyed a, a Cinderella bakery or another shop in these yeah. uh, bay uh, places. So um, between 2015 and 2017, I was a student at University of San Francisco. And unfortunately, my studies came to a premature end because I was really busy working and I couldn't afford to fly back and forth between San Francisco and LA. And... It was a really amazing experience. I loved living in San Francisco for the time that I did. But I I think that part of it for me was that I had gone to college a lot as a life experience and less to fully get a degree. But I was in a very unique position because I was working on Steven Universe at the time. And so when there was an episode for me to record, I would fly from San Francisco to LA. And then I would sometimes be gone on weekends to go to conventions. And so I didn't have 100% of my energy to focus on school. But at the time, I was an advertising major. <laughs> which probably, I was probably watching too much Mad Men. Absolutely. Um, Grace Sakura Rolek, your voice and your time is precious. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. This has been such a fun conversation. I love chatting about <laughs> gardening and restoring furniture. I'm so happy you brought that up. That's, that's been, that's been very fun for me recently, but yeah, as far as my work goes, thank you so much for giving me a chance to talk about what I've got going on and what's gone on in the past.